Welcome everybody to another episode of The Solar Journey. And uh, today we have a new guest. It's uh, Jonas Conny of Greenbite. Welcome, Jonas. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here, Torsten. Yeah. So uh, let me first please introduce uh, Jonas. And I'll just go briefly through his uh, CV and you will see that he's a serial entrepreneur. Um, he's got a degree in management from the ETH Zurich in Switzerland. And he also took part in an executive program in Stanford University in the USA. In uh, 2005, he founded a web agency. Um, he ran it for five years. And, uh, but he keep, then he keeps on founding new companies. So in 2008, he founded another company called Don't Buy It. It's a pretty cool name, I think. Um, It's a, yeah, it's a website, I guess, uh, which aggregates comments from unhappy customers and forwards this feedback in an aggregate, aggregated way to, uh, to the actual vendor, supplier, and companies. Pretty cool. And in 2009, he founded a, a website which allows volunteers to find work experience on organic farms. So uh, I think we can see here now the shift towards sustainable lifestyle also. We'll, we'll learn about it in a, in a bit, I guess. Um, uh, but now he's not part of these companies anymore, if I understand correctly, at least not in an active executive way. Uh, in, uh, in 2010, he founded Greenbyte, the company he's now still working for as a CEO. And uh, Greenbyte is a, is a software company and uh, it helps to bring down the cost of wind energy so bits and winds this is what green uh, bite brings together uh, we will touch later on uh, on what green bite actually does um let me just uh, uh have some initial questions on, on Jonas. so you founded two four companies that that's a lot right and uh, you you still look pretty young so uh, you, you You, you seem to be dedicated on founding companies. When did you feel the, is it an urge or the desire to, to do this, to found companies? How, how did that come about? Well, Torsten, the fact is I'm not so young. I just use great skin products. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're selling no. them as well? <laughs> uh, no, but seriously, uh, yeah, it's, um, I haven't really thought about uh, starting companies in that way. It's, um, it just happened very naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, we were a group of friends who built, built some websites when we were younger. And all of a sudden we built a website for a company and we needed to send an invoice. So we needed to start a company and uh, kind of off we were. Mm -hmm. And um, we did that for a few years and we realized that being a consultant is really hard and we wanted to build a product company instead. So um, we tried to build Don't Buy It. We failed miserably. Uh, and, um, but the one thing that we did learn was that if we ever find, found a company again, is that we need to focus. And it's all about focus. Uh, and uh, so when we founded Greenbyte, we thought, we thought that, okay, let's, uh, if you, we were four. So three of us went and worked in Greenbyte. 100% dedicated, one of us worked in the consultancy, and over time, Greenbyte started to become more successful, and it's a product company, that's what we wanted to do in a really interesting space, and then we just focused on, uh, on Greenbyte full in. So, yeah, I guess what we learned from that is just like focus is so important. Yeah, interesting. Um, so, the, so the very first um, Company, it's the same team, right? All the, company, the, all the companies I mentioned, these are, it was always the same team, right? Uh, yep. Looks like a dream team. Yeah. It is a dream team. We complement yeah. each other very well. Yeah. So two of us are deeply technical. Mm -hmm. um, one is uh, much more marketing and um, front-end user interface oriented. And yeah. um, then it's myself, who's just a generalist. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Oh, cool. And, and you know from school? Or what you, I think you mentioned that earlier. Or? Yeah. No. So, uh, so one of the one of them I know from when we were six years old. So really, oh, wow. really long time. Wow. Yeah. And um, one I met in uh, in high school, and the other in university. Yeah. 
Okay. So what makes you stick together? Did you did you elaborate for yourself or as a team on this? Why why do you why does it work, right? I mean, you said you're complementary, but what else is is? You know, I think that when you start a company, you have to. I, I think it's important to be a team, uh, to be a few people, because building a company is so hard. Mm. Uh, and I think that when you when you I don't know, decide who to work with. You want to work with someone you trust. Trust. And who okay. do you, who do you, who do you trust better than your friends? Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, we started a company. We were friends for a long time and, uh, we trusted each other. We knew each other about each other's boundaries. Uh, and, um, I mean, to be honest, we, we fought a lot, uh, during, during the early days of, of the business about where do we go? And actually maybe not so much about where do we go, but about stupid stuff, like what color should this button in the front end be? And what, uh, like really stupid stuff. But I would say yeah. like the long term has not been anything that we have been, we've been, we've had a pretty clear picture about where we want to go. Yeah. Um, but some, but, but given that we know each other so well, we don't have any, I mean, we know the boundaries, but sometimes we know, okay, we, when I cross these boundaries, things are going to go sour. And yeah. sometimes when you're in an emotional state, you, you just choose to go across that boundary. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of, that happens. And over time, if you can, if you can talk about it afterwards, it builds even more trust. Mm. Yeah. So I think that trust component is really important when you want to start a company with somebody and, yeah. and the complementarities too. Yeah. Cool. Hey, w wonderful input for uh, other listeners who may be interested in, in found, founding a company. Uh, thanks for, for, for elaborating on this. So the, the other companies, they are, they are not operative anymore or that's, that's no, they're no. not. Uh, okay. and, uh, yeah. Okay. I, th I thought, I thought all of them were good ideas. So it's too bad, but it's yeah, about they, focus. when I read about them, then I thought, well, oh, that's pretty good. Um, so, um, so how did that switch come about or how did, how, when did you move solar or you, the four, the four of you moved solar, right? You started as a, a web agency and then, uh, you know, customer feedback, then, uh, you know, that, uh, organic farming. Yeah. yeah. So how, I mean, how did that happen? Right. How, how did you find yeah. your. Uh, so, uh, I mean, if the organic farming part is kind of a separate, uh, separate track. So maybe we focus like on, on green bike because I could go far down into the organic farming part, but maybe it wouldn't be so relevant for the listeners. So, mm -hmm. um, but if, if talking about like, um, um, the, the green bite and how we came into this. And so we had this consultancy business and we were consulting and building, um, websites and doing some marketing work and things, but we knew we wanted to build that, this product company. And so one of our customers back then was a uh, wind power developer. So they were developing wind farms and, um, they, uh, when you develop wind farms, you need to know how windy it is uh, in, uh, in the forest. So you have a bunch of uh, measurement devices in the forest. Yeah. And uh, they said to us, and they were from, coming from different manufacturers. And when they said, since we knew technology, they said, can you guys just consolidate all of the data coming from these wind measurement devices? Because the wind measurement device is the quality of that data is super important because And the wind is what's going to determine all future cash flows. So you want yeah. to know exactly what the wind is. Yeah. And so they, yeah, so we did that as a like consultancy project. And then we had all of the data in the database and they said, well, can you show us some reports? Can you build some screens where we can see how windy it is? Can you do some data quality assurance? And yeah. And all of a sudden we had a little product and we thought, hmm, probably other people are going to want something like this as well. So we went out and asked other developers if they would buy this, if we built it as a like product that could be sold. And they said, yes. And uh, so then we thought, okay, this is uh, an opportunity for us. It's in renewable energy, which we know is going to happen because the world doesn't have uh, a choice. It has to happen. And um, so we knew that the macro was great for that. We uh, knew software. Uh, we love data and, um, building a company um, yeah I mean let's do it stars were aligned and we started in this little little niche which is wind measurements and of course Sweden being a super small country doesn't have so many wind measurements so 
our second customer was in Costa Rica. Our third customer was in like South Africa or something. So we were pretty like international from day one. Yeah. And uh, that's the way I find. And one of the things I love about renewable energy is just how international this business is. And mm. uh, so, and being Swedish, I mean, we have to go outside of Sweden because Sweden is like 9 million people. And uh, yeah, we're just small. Can't build yeah. a company in Sweden. Yeah. Oh, there's many big famous uh, Swedish companies. Um, you seem to naturally uh, do a good job in, uh, in going overseas. Yeah. Cool. So, um, so what, what, what exactly is the, the problem you're solving at Greenbyte? So it's, it's putting together the data or is it a lot more, has it grown well beyond that? Or, yeah. yeah. So it started out with this like measurement data from the winds, from wind measurement devices. Yeah. And we did that for like, I don't know, three or four years. We were five people in the company. And um, so really niche market. But all of a sudden, our customers had verified the wind, they had gotten the financing, and they had built operating wind farms. And they came back to us and said, yeah, we'd like to collect this data as well, because uh, we own uh, turbines from Siemens, from um, Vestas, from GE, and Enercon, and we want to collect all of this data in one place. And that's what you guys do, right? And we said, yeah, that's what we do. So um, then we said, okay, let's build a product for this. And uh, we built a new product. And... Um, um back then we called it breeze and uh it's uh yeah people started to like that and the market was bigger more customers came in and we um hired more people and the company really started to grow yeah. and then our customers were like okay so we're not just a wind company we're a renewable energy company we want to invest in solar assets as well and so they came back to us and said can you build something for solar And we said, yeah, we can do that. So then we built a new product and we called it Bright. So we had two products, Breeze and Bright. Uh, nice and, yeah. um, and then uh, we started to think about, but yeah, I mean, wind and solar, they're going to be big. But in order to really like have an impact, we're going to need to think about more technologies. We're going to need battery storage. We're going to need hydro. Maybe we're going to need geothermal and like, all these types of energy sources so we thought okay and no nobody's going to remember all of our names breeze bright stream green bite it's too much mm. so let's just call our product green bite and let's make it technology agnostic and so that we can be the company that is empowering uh, the renewable energy from a digital perspective to grow even faster and um, so that's what we're all about today is to empower the owners of large scale renewable energy with the digital tools to produce more renewable energy. That's what we do today. Okay. So you, um, the, the initial product was to collect the wind data and now you bring together the actual kilowatt hour output from different uh, turbines. Exactly. Right? So it's like, yeah. and from turbines and from solar parks and, and from solar so parks. Yeah. So it's getting that, data from the asset yeah but the data from the asset really isn't enough to manage an asset you need to have other sources you need to have what is the power price uh, what, are, what are the power prices what mm -hmm. is the power forecast um what is the uh, substation doing um what is um other measurement devices on site so getting all of this data together and helping our customers to optimize and operate uh, their assets okay so How does it help to, to optimize it so they know more precisely what they will produce so they can um, achieve a better price on the market for, for their renewable electricity? Is, is that yeah, there, there are a couple of ways to think about this. Yeah. One way is, of course, like the, the basic scenario, which is when you, in which you have availability. So when a... Uh, and I'll use the wind turbine case, this go, or wind farm case, it goes exactly similar or very similar in the solar, solar case. But basically you have a wind turbine mm -hmm. and, you, and you have the availability of that wind turbine. Can it mm -hmm. produce energy or can it not produce energy? And so you want that turbine to, produce, to be able to produce energy when there is wind and when the electricity prices are high. Mm -hmm. So we measure what is the availability of the turbine and Many of our customers are in full service contract with their turbine OEM. So we help our customers uh, to evaluate that they're getting the availability 
um, that is in line with the availability contract that they have with the OEM. Ah, okay. So yeah. making sure that the turbines are able to produce energy um, as much of the time as possible. Yeah. The second thing is to optimize the performance. So when the turbines are performing, are they producing as much energy as they should be? Okay. And um, that's not always the case uh, because sometimes there can be your misalignments, there can be um, wrong control settings in the control system. And so being able to capture this over a large base of assets uh, is really valuable for our customers. Mm -hmm. So that's availability and performance. Yeah. And a lot of the time, uh, historically, the amount of energy that you produce is linearly correlated with the amount of revenue that you could generate from a renewable energy asset because you had a feed-in tariff or you had some other mechanism that gave you, I don't know, 75 euros per megawatt hour that you produced mm. for the next 15 years. In the world we're in today, I don't see that. What's going renewable energy, wind and solar, they're so um, cost competitive that they are not going to be getting those incentives as they had in the past. So now we add a ne next level of volatility that owners need to take care of, and that is the price. So price is going to be um, energy from renewable energy is going to be traded on merchant basis. So basically, there's going to be price volatility as well. And that needs to be brought into the operational strategy of, um, of an owner in order to maximize revenue coming from a renewable energy asset. Yeah. What's, what's the, where are we today with uh, the cost of wind energy, roughly? What? Uh, the cost of wind energy, you or know, the, or a typical I, PPA price. I mean, the, the price, let's talk about the price. Yeah. The price. Okay. <laughs> but I wish I could give you an answer. This is not really my level of expertise, but okay. I can say, I, I'm not, I'm not sure about the listeners. Um, a lot of your listeners probably know this a lot better than me. So, yeah. but what we can say is like, there's onshore and there's offshore and offshore yeah. is still, um, a lot more expensive to build. Some people say twice as expensive to build, but of course the winds uh, on offshore are a lot better. So you can still get economics in building a, uh, an offshore wind park. Mm. But uh, in terms of the LCOE or like the PPA prices, I, I can't really tell you. Okay. No, no worries. Thanks. Um, so uh, when you sell the, the electricity, what cycles do they have to optimize the, the forecast? Is it like a, for the next day or is it for 15 minutes? Do you, do you know? Mm. Yeah. Uh, so in terms of the like um, the differences in uh, there are quite some regional differences in how you can trade energy, mm. um, but if we take um, a, a market which is quite advanced in how to trade energy, uh, mm. we can look at the Nordics. Um, they have come quite a, quite a, quite a, quite a way in order to design the energy system in order mm. to find um, the correct incentives to build out renewable energy. Um, the way that energy is traded at, in, in the Nordics is that you, you have to, um, at 12 o'clock or midday, noon, you have to say to the market how much you expect to produce from, uh, for, the next, um, for the next day. So 12 hours before, you have to say how much you're going to produce for the next 12 to 36 hours. And you have to say uh, how much you're going to do on an hourly basis this is going to become even shorter. So you can have to say on a 15 minute basis. Um, and if you are uh, producing more or you're producing less, you need, you need to pay basically. Um, because um, it's not, the grid can't handle more energy and it can't handle less energy. It needs to be in balance with what's being consumed. So having an accurate forecast is absolutely key. And there are many ways, there are many aspects into bring in uh, an accurate forecast. It's about weather, like how is, how are the winds going to blow? And it's also about the availability of the assets themselves. Like, are they going to be available to produce? Yeah. All right. Um, so, so it's at 12 o'clock at lunch, basically you have to say for the next 12 or 36 hours, depending on the city, uh, the, this country. No, sorry, sorry. I wasn't clear. So at noon, you have yeah, to say, noon? how much you're going to produce from midnight to midnight. From midnight to midnight for the next, yeah. so in 12 hours for the next 12 hours. Yes, uh, the next 24 hours. Okay, and, and uh, on the granularity on uh, an hour, hourly basis? Yes. Okay, and you, you get a penalty basically if you produce more or less 
right? Because right. less there's somebody needs to buy expensive uh, electricity. Well, actually, more expensive. Actually, what, actually, what you have to do is if you produce less, you have to go out and source the energy. Um, right. So you have to so compensate that, you, that for yourself, right? Exactly. Yeah. And if uh, it's a scenario where there is not enough energy on the grid, that energy becomes really expensive. Uh, yeah. So, uh, um, so there are a few, and, and most of the time it doesn't really matter because there is energy available, but there are a few hours every year where that energy becomes very, very expensive, like mm -hmm. crazy expensive. And that is what can make That's or break. 10 times more merge. than normal or 100 times? Or? Yeah, maybe like 100. Uh, I've seen a th yeah, okay. I've seen a thousand times more expensive. A so, thousand times more. Uh, for, for a few hours. Okay. All right. So uh, if you produce uh, too little, then you have to source yourself, which can be super mm -hmm. expensive. And if you produce yeah. too much, then, yeah. then, then you, you also have to, have to sell pay. it. Oh, you can sell it. Yeah, or you can curtail and oh, you just uh, waste it. Bring down, or, yeah. Or you but, but, change um, the blades of the turbine and reduce less. Exactly. But that means that you need to have the ability to do that. Uh, yeah. And uh, that's not always the case. Yeah. Yeah. So the funny thing with electricity, right? You, I mean, there's storage, right? But if you produce it and you don't have storage yourself, you, you, you can't. That's why you have to uh, be careful about it, right? You just can't squeeze it into the grid, right? The, the, it, it will be rejected physically, right? Or that's the... Um, you know, I'm not exactly sure what happens if you uh, actually produce more, but I would guess that there would be like frequency issues on the yeah, grid. Yeah, yeah. And if there are frequency issues on the grid, someone is going to be really pissed off. <laughs> yeah, to a certain level, it can be compensated with the frequency, but I think there's a limit for all the appliances, right? They, they might go wild at some stage. Yeah. Good, excellent, and um, and you're you're offering your your software that, that so that's one package now, right? The, the collecting data, checking the availability, and Correct. doing the forecasting. That's hmm? the one software package, right? And you provide it as a as a as a service. So it's a yeah, actually, you know what? Yeah. yeah, what we're what we're trying to do is that so we, we sell our services as software as a service. So mm -hmm. basically, we charge on a per megawatt basis. Uh, so how many megawatts does our customer have installed? And we then the price is determined on the number of megawatts. But one thing that we have come to realize is that um, our customers are um, very smart and have very large needs. Um, so, uh, and because the market is changing so much all the time, we have determined that we're a small company. We're, I don't know, like 85 people. And yeah. we're not going to be able to solve all of the issues that our customers have. Um, because they may be varying in different um, regions or over different technologies. And uh, so what we have decided to do is to make the data available to third parties so that others can build applications on top of the data that we have in the platform. Um, this is of course with the consent of those, um, of the customers that want these uh, add-on services. But basically we wanna build like kind of what Salesforce has done in the CRM market, where they build a platform in which company, other companies can tap into the data and offer additional value. And we yeah. want to do exactly the same thing in the renewable energy space. Yeah. Wonderful platform business, everybody. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So um, that's, that's interesting. Cool. You mentioned you are 85 people. C can you share how many customers you have just to give uh, the listeners an yeah. idea of? So we have uh, about 120 customers. Yeah. In how many countries? It's... Um, they're like in 30-ish countries, yeah. something like that. On all continents, you talked about uh, Costa Rica, I think. <laughs> yeah, we actually have company okay, customers on all continents, yeah. Yeah, we do. Cool. Antarctica, yeah. actually, maybe not, but uh, yeah. all of the other continents, yeah. Yeah, wow. And uh, can you give us an indication of, of the revenue of your business size and, and uh, just the range? Sure. So... Um, if we think about like our um, the footprint that our customers have or the portfolio that's installed in, in Greenbyte, yeah. we're at uh, around 30, 34 gigawatts yeah. um, oh, wow. of, yeah. of assets. And um, our, our revenue is like, 
I won't give you an exact uh, yeah, number, but I'll give yeah. you like an order of magnitude. Sure. It's like, uh, yeah, somewhere in sub 10 million euros. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. And um, so, so how do others, how do companies who are not your customers yet, how do they operate their, their wind farms? Is there, they're using in-house software, in-house solutions or? Um, yeah. So, um, you know, one of the things is that, uh, unfortunately, we have some competitors uh, yeah. who, uh, who, yeah. <laughs> who, who, uh, who some, some of our, uh, some of these uh, companies use. Yeah. Um, but I would say that, um, and, and we look at the market in like different, some different spaces, but like utilities, they tend to have systems that have been internally developed uh, in order to, to manage this. So, Some utilities have large development teams where they mm. work with assembling the data, harmonizing the data, and making the data into actionable insights. So yeah. some, some have built their own, and some have, um, are using one of our competitors, and um, some just don't have a system. They rely on completely on the service Excel. providers that they're... Excel uh, or Excel, yeah, even yeah. Excel. Uh, <laughs> um. So that's an interesting area here, right? In the good old world, right? Like let's say three decades ago or so, basically you had these big utilities, right? So in Germany, there's like uh, four or five, they, they, you know, they had monopolies in their region, right? There was a RWE and the EMBV and, and then there's Vattenfall, right? Um, who came into Germany, I don't know, some years ago. So these big, 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 big corporations, right? Um, I guess that's the ones you call and I call would call uh, utilities, right? And then you now have with uh, with the renewables, those independent power producers, which are called the IPPs in, in the in the community, right? Mm -hmm. They are new in the area, and and w I guess I would assume they are mostly your customers, right? They they are new in the market. They they have a maybe a different culture, different approach to to the whole industry to your whole mindset would, would you also would you also separate the the energy industry now in these and then of course you have those private and super small scale uh power producer right is that also yeah. the the sectors how would you describe the the current energy yeah this is um, something that we think about scale? quite a lot we think yeah. about who where who is going to own the assets in the future yeah. um so Yes, we look at the IPPs, and yes, that is our core customer base. Uh, and um, we do believe that the IPPs are going to grow a lot, and they grow a lot because they have access to uh, capital that is um, of low cost, let's say, um, pension money. Mm -hmm. So uh, a lot of pension money is going into uh, IPPs. Um, and then we have the utilities who I think are going to, I don't know. I think a lot of IPP, a lot of utilities may be struggling because they're sitting with asset bases that are going to become pretty soon toxic basically. And how do you get out of that and get into renewables? Um, I'm not, I'm not certain. Um, so I'm a big believer in the IPPs, but then there is a third player that I think is going to have, um, could have a really big impact. And that are the oil and gas companies. Like if you look at the market cap of oil and gas companies compared to utilities um, around the world, oil and, ga oil and gas companies completely dwarf uh, the, uh, the market cap of all utilities. So if the oil companies want, they have balance sheets and access to capital that can get into renewables in a big, big way. Mm. But again, they are sitting with those assets that may become toxic pretty soon. And um, I believe that the change from, um, from powering the world from, by hydrocarbons and into renewables, I think it's going to go pretty fast. Uh, and uh, so I think it's, uh, yeah, we're just getting started and it's, uh, it's going to go faster and faster, is my belief, because fundamentally we don't have an option. Yeah. Um, so, but it, I, 
it is interesting though to think about like where we get our energy from and um like still today less than 25 percent of the energy is electricity uh mm. the rest is basically burning of hydrocarbons and even within that electricity 25 percent, a lot is burning of hydrocarbons so what's going to be important for the future is increased electrification and that that increased electrification is powered by renewables but i mean yes 75 percent is coming from transport heat uh, which is something that we maybe don't think about so much but uh that's where the real change can be made is by electrifying more and more and by getting those that electricity from renewables yeah yeah so uh th that's a uh, plenty of super interesting stuff you just covered um uh I would like to jump back and hopefully you don't we okay. don't forget what you just mentioned. <laughs> so the oil and gas money, let's put it this way, right? Mm -hmm. Where do you think they're gonna go, right? Um I mean they it's it's all their assets on the value they have. Are they gonna hunt the IPPs eventually, right? I mean um I mean what yeah. what what's gonna happen, it, right? I, yeah. I think it comes down to because the investments into renewable energy or any energy asset class are so big and they're so long term that I think the companies that are going to win are the ones that have access to the lowest cost of capital. And then if you have access to the lowest cost of capital, that's a really competitive advantage. Uh, and then you can organize yourself so that you can run these assets um, in, in the best way possible. But I think lowest cost access to lowest cost of capital is what's going to determine who ends up with the most amount of renewable energy assets. Right. And and what what does it take to have this good access to to, ca to capital? It takes a really solid uh, balance sheet and a really um, uh, good view on how future cash flows are going to become available in the future and this is where i think that maybe the oil companies could be struggling is because if investors think or debt providers think that they are not going to generate enough cash coming from the renewables i'm oh, sorry from the oil the cost of capital may increase for those companies mm -hmm. and may and that would be beneficial for the ipps um so um Yeah, I, I, this is something I'm not certain about, yeah, yeah, I, and it keeps me it, ke it keeps me up at night. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <it's>, uh, <laughs> because a lot of it actually comes back to how do we build our product? Do mm. we build our product for a company that is like Chevron or Shell or BP, yeah. or do we build our product for a much more lean uh, IPP? Yeah. And uh, I think that the right decision for us right now is to think about Uh, how we can build our product uh, for IPPs. And um, if we are in a situation where IPPs are getting acquired by oil and gas companies, mm. um, we need to be fast in order to switch our own strategy in order to be able to support those oil and gas companies. But yeah. I really don't know where those yeah, assets are going to end up. Right? Nobody. Um, but but mm. I do think I do I do think that there are economies of scale. I think that the portfolios are going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, I mean, solar and renewables was this kind of underground movement, right? It's it's like a, at least in, for, in Germany. I'm I'm in from Germany, so the the initial development was through private people, right? And it has it had this kind of energy becomes it democratic free available um um uh yeah source right and uh but how regulation has changed in germany it uh, it became more and more favorable for for larger companies right and uh, the importance of balance sheets you just mentioned is uh is stressed more and more because particularly for the uh for the ppas right because you since you have to um have a strong balance sheet to uh, com to minimize the risk for for um, purchasing uh, power if you don't if you can't provide power from your renewable energy source so in a way there's a 
a natural but also regulatory move, at least in, in Germany, I would say in most countries, that uh, it's going to go to the bigger and bigger guys more and more, right? Um, you know, I, I, think, I think that there are two paths here. I think that a lot of people themselves are interested in becoming more self-sufficient on mm -hmm. energy. And I think it's the same. That's why I was so interested in organic farming before is that people are interested in, in kind of being a bit more independent and being able to, because the world, I, I think it's like the, it's, it's like when you have this, this whole digital world that where people are living in their filter bubbles and uh, uh, we're becoming more and more interconnected. I always think that when there's such a strong trend, there is a counter trend. And I think that trend is all about like being self-sufficient in terms of energy and food and whatever it is. So, mm. I, and it feels good to produce your own energy. Yeah. It's awesome. It's control, right? And you, you understand it's, it's, it becomes at least a bit, at least you have some tangible things, right? Because in all digital world, there's, it's not tangible, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so I, 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 I think that like, of course there's going to be, these big wind farms and big solar plants that are going to produce uh, a lot of energy. But at the same time, I, I'm really bullish on the more individual being able to purchase uh, their own energy plant and to run mm. it on the roof or in their garden. Um, and um, so I, I think that's going to happen in a big way. And especially now that prices come down um, uh, of buying those systems, that's going to happen for sure. Mm. Um, and, and long term, I think that we're going to have such an abundance of electricity that electricity prices are going to be basically zero. Uh, so it's, um, yeah. Oh, wow. I, I, I'm of the belief that we're going to have just too much energy. Yeah. Have you considered to also provide a solution for like, you know, the private household a house owner who you know has a 10 kilowatt system. And I mean, if he produces too much and he, his, his batteries are full and his car is already fully charged and, uh, He can't run more dishwashers uh, than uh, he's already running because <laughs> yeah. he would you know, also need a solution to sell his uh, it would be fantastic if he could sell the electricity just a little at least right and it has to be fully automated which you know is possible right yeah, yeah. I, i think i think um that's awesome uh and i'd love to play a part in that But uh, for Greenbyte, the way that we are organized and the way that um, it, it comes back to like our sales process is really geared towards larger players, uh, yeah. which means that we invest quite a lot in our marketing and sales. Yeah. So in order for it to make sense, we need to go after bigger deals. Yeah. Um, so our company is kind of organized to go after uh, those large portfolios. Mm. So at the time, if we were to start to play a part in uh, the more residential um, growth of solar, we would need to build our product a little bit differently and put more responsibility on the individual who connects to our product. Yeah. And right now, that's not part of, of what we do. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. And then uh, the other thing you, you mentioned earlier on, and I mean... <sighs> Before we uh, I pressed the record button, uh, we had a chat about your, your background picture and you said, um, maybe you can highlight that again. Why, why you think you like, you like the picture taken from the moon? Yeah. yeah. So I have this picture here uh, to remind me that like going to the moon is, is hard. It's really hard. <laughs> and mm. doing it in the 60s, that's even harder. Yeah. Uh, and in comparison, like building out renewable energy is easy. And yeah. it's such an imperative that we have uh, in for all of us around the world. Uh, so, and we have the technology, we have the funding. Uh, so it's easy. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, so I just think that, I, I mean, I know this is going to happen. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's not going to be that hard. Yeah. So uh, for everybody just listening to the, to the audio version of this uh, interview, um, Jonas has a uh, picture taken from the moon looking back onto the to the earth it's it's a wonderful picture um, yeah fantastic view on it um it's uh, it's, it's inspiring your your view on uh, on how um, renewables will uh, will grow but 
earlier you mentioned on you mentioned it's gonna fast it's gonna go fast fast a lot lot a lot faster than people might think what makes you so optimistic about it what what are the what's the dynamic here well the first thing that makes me really optimistic is just looking at the data mm. uh looking at if we go back to i don't know 2005 and looking at the projections of how much solar there would be in the world then we go to 2006 and we go to 2007, 2009, etc. Every time that we have tried to project how much solar is going to grow, we have underestimated mm -hmm. historically. And so that speaks to the fact that solar is just going to grow rapidly. And I think we're doing exactly the same mistake now in, in storage. We're thinking about how much storage there's going to be in the world. And I think we're underestimating it completely. The driver uh, is the speed which with cost is going down in these technologies mm. so um yeah it's um I, i think we're just underestimating the speed and uh so and it's becoming cheaper and we all know it has to happen so yeah. that's why i think it's going to go faster yeah what's your take on nuclear energy nuclear energy <laughs> yeah that's a good one um i don't mind nuclear energy i think mm. nuclear energy um as a concept Uh, is is good. I just don't think it's price competitive. It's, uh, it's it's just yeah. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't make economic sense to build it. Yeah. So, uh, but I'm I'm not I'm not opposed to nuclear energy. Um, yeah. It's uh, but from a financial perspective, I just don't think it makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Well, apparently there, uh, there was a study um, um, on uh, trying to get an insurance for for operating in a nuclear power plant. And that alone, that alone just ruins the whole business case, right? And yeah. uh, I mean, fortunately, I mean, unfortunately, you could say, unfortunately, um, the operators of nuclear power plants don't need to have this insurance cost. Basically, the old individuals uh, <laughs> uh, pay the bill if, if something happens, right? So, so that's, that's, the only, that's the only reason why, in my opinion, nuclear energy actually works right now, because we just, There is no, if something happens, then it's just bad luck, right? Yeah, it's the whole thing of not taking like enough of those negative externalities into effect in how yeah. you price uh, and tax nuclear energy. So, yeah, yeah. but I, I, there, I think there's a point to be made here about like the, the modern environmentalist. Uh, and I think that a modern environmentalist needs to think about how to make this change happen in a capitalist environment. Uh, and uh, because at the end of the day, our, our like society is based on generating profit for someone. Mm. And um, so in order to accomplish change, I think you need to play by those rules. Yeah. Um, of course, I think that like Greenpeace and activism have an important role to play. Um, but, but like to really make change, we need to play by the rules that we as a democracy have set up. And uh, those rules is basically capitalism. And yeah. uh, so a lot, a lot of impact can be had by playing by those rules, I, yeah. I believe, because the trend is going in that way. Yeah. Interesting topic. I don't know if you dare to comment on this, but many, many blame exactly capitalism for the climate crisis or the climate change we are in. What, what's, mm -hmm. your, what's your take on that? If you, if no, you I share that. want to comment. I share that. I totally share that. Yeah. It's um, it's again take, not taking negative externalities into into account. Okay. Um, so I, I I totally share that. Like, if we look back to maybe the I don't know industrial revolution, uh, we realized that in order to generate growth, we need energy. Okay. What's the cheapest way of generating energy? Yeah, it's burning hydrocarbons. Hydrocarbons exist in abundance and. Uh, Let's just burn them. Let's have an efficiency of like 20% when we burn them and 80% going off to like heat and um, yeah, just being stupid about how we use them. But it made economic sense. So I, I share yeah. that view completely. And I do think that like the incentives from capitalism in order to make this change are there though. So, uh, uh, but of course, like we need to, as a society, think about taxing the negative externalities in a way that we haven't before um so so uh yeah so but it would mean sticking to capitalism but just including the externalities like fixing the uh fixing the 
the, the problem we had in the past that externalities were not included in the cost calculation, right? I mean, the fact that, uh, that oil and gas are still heavily subsidized mm. is just insane. Yeah. Uh, and um, there it's uh, up to every person to vote so that uh, we get regulation that makes sure that we can't subsidize a type of um, energy production. Yeah. This is my opinion, but yeah, uh, yeah, 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 sure. It's uh, we're touching touchy ground <laughs> <laughs> here, but uh, yeah, point well taken, and and uh, I think I share, I share share the same view. So it's gonna go um grow like crazy um because the costs are coming down, but then you also mentioned the the regulatory aspect, right? Um, avoiding subsidies. So. As, as a final remark, because I know you, you need to run now, um, what, what does it take to bring it to the next level, right? I mean, the growth is there, as you mentioned, 10, maybe 20% each year. Many say it's not enough, right, to, uh, to meet the, the Paris climate targets. What does it take to accelerate the, the growth of the renewables, in your view? Well, I do think that the money is there. Mm. I think that uh, the technology is there, yeah. um, but I think that there is um, room for more uh, clear regulation on how these assets can be built out. Um, if we look at uh, many parts of the world, um, it's not possible to build out renewable energy due to different um, regulatory rules. I mean, you can't build close to airports because radars could be, I don't know, sometimes I think that they, they are um, just people opposed to renewable energy who set a lot of, a lot of these rules. Yeah. And, but and in, in some areas, of course, there is um, flora and fauna and other aspects to be taken in, in that, that need to be taken into account in order to keep biodiversity and mm. um, like yeah th those types of things in place because yeah. but I, I think that the rules are they need to become a little bit more lax so that this technology and this capital can be deployed yeah. in order to speed up um, the uh, yeah speed up the the, the like inherent power of, of uh, what's going on right now. Yeah. And then I think that uh, there is something to be said about like the, the regulatory environment for batteries and storage, which I uh -huh. think is going to be an absolute necessity in the future. And today it's hard to make an investment into storage because people don't know what I, how do I make money off of this? Mm -hmm. So I think that, that the, like the, the regulation is probably where, um, something that's stopping us right now it's not yeah. the capital it's not the technology yeah. it's more about how it can be deployed yeah. um so I, I think that's where where we have a lot of work to do excellent i never thought of the 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 storage part do you have ideas or do you know about ideas how storage uh, can be included in the in the energy pricing i mean i, I um uh it's uh it's a, it's a it's a topic where we are doing quite some research within Greenbyte to mm -hmm. understand this better. Um, like the I would say like the layman's view is to just uh, like store energy when prices are cheap and then to release energy when prices are high. But uh, there is a lot more around like how quickly could you be able how, how quickly can you ramp the battery? Like can you use it for frequency regulation? Can you do I don't know. Uh, this is an area that I personally don't know so much about. I just yeah. heard from my team that this is, um, yeah. these are areas where there isn't really regulation. And I think that with batteries, there are going to become so many new possible interesting ways to generate revenue. Um, yeah. with, as I said before, electricity prices are going down. Um, so, I, so I think electricity prices are going towards zero. I think the way that you're going to be able to generate energy, generate revenue within it, energy as a whole is by selling more value added services. And I think batteries are an excellent way to sell those value added services. Mm. Um, so, but we don't know, 
Um, don't we don't know what the, what the, like, we don't have the framework in order to, where investors don't have the framework in order to build their business case around storage. Yeah. Yeah. The journey hasn't ended yet. Um, but today, um, we need to end. Um, Jonas, it's been a wonderful talk, man. It's, uh, again, time rushed by so quickly. Um, thanks, thanks so much for coming onto the show and, and sharing your views. It's been super inspiring and, uh, yeah, all the best with Greenbyte. Thanks a lot. And, uh, you challenged me a lot, Torsten. I, I haven't thought through all of these things, so, um, uh, I will, uh, need to, um, go back and think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good thing, right? I mean, I hope, <laughs> hope you didn't mind. Yeah, yeah, fantastic. Um, do call me at midnight when you uh, again have your sleepless nights when you think about stuff and uh, or text me. Maybe that's better if you have another cool idea. Yeah. Hey, it's been a pleasure, Jonas. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye bye.